QSO Today, Episode 209, Jim Forkin, WA3TFS. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the finest HF, VHF, and UHF transceivers for every level of amateur radio operator. And by QRP Labs, makers of the QCX Single Band Transceiver Kit. Please support the QSO Today podcast by supporting these fine sponsors. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth for Z1UG, your host. I admit that I like to interview ham radio home brewers and builders just to hear about what's on their bench and how their projects evolve. My QSO today is with Jim Forkin, WA3TFS, who started contributing to QSD and Ham Radio Magazine as far back as 1983 with his projects. Jim shares his ham radio story and his incorporation of new technology, including Arduino microcontrollers, into his still evolving and complex projects. WA3TFS, this is Eric for Z1UG. Are you there, Jim? Hi, Eric. It's WA3 Tango Fox Sierra, Jim in Pittsburgh. Nice to hear you. Jim, thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? Well, it started quite a few years ago. Uh, I actually first uh, became aware of amateur radio um, back when I was probably about eight or nine years old. My parents had an old Philco um, desktop uh, receiver, you know, with a wooden cabinet and all, and it had a couple of short wave bands on it, as well as a normal broadcast and FM stations. I think it dated back to around 1953 or so, the uh, when the, when the radio was built. Um, anyway, tuning across that, I found the, the, the world of uh, shortwave radio, and I started listening to some stations from all the different countries. It seemed kind of interesting. Well, it actually covered uh, the 20-meter amateur band as well, and uh, I came across uh, some hams talking on 20-meter AM, and I thought it was kind of interesting. So, And then I also heard uh, some CW, although it was an AM only, you could hear the thump, you know, when they were sending and receiving, uh, or when they were sending the CW. So uh, around that time, I was, uh, I'd become involved in uh, the Boy Scouts. And uh, when I was about 11 years old or so, I uh, was in the Boy Scouts working to, to earn the merit badges that you can get there. And one of them was... Uh, radio merit badge and uh, signaling, and signaling included Morse code along with semaphore and that sort of stuff. So I really became interested, and I learned uh, Morse code at, the, at that time. And uh, it was uh, sort of opened up a new field there. Now, I didn't really get involved in amateur radio at that point because I really didn't know too much about it, but uh, I think the interest was there. And then uh, I know I remember one time we were camping uh, with the Boy Scouts, and uh, just on a whim there, I pulled up a flashlight and I sent uh, CQ from uh, Troop 224, you know, across the field there. And sure enough, somebody came back with a flashlight uh, and tried to make a contact. And pretty soon there was like eight or nine different flashlights going <laughs> in the uh, campground there to different people. So that was, that was kind of an interesting thing. And then uh, a little bit later on there, then I, I decided I was really going to get into amateur radio there. Um, but I didn't, still didn't know much about it. But there was a magazine called Popular Electronics that was on the market at the time. And I used to pick that up at the, uh, the local store and uh, read through it. And I really enjoyed that because it always had construction articles in it. And there was also a column in there uh, about amateur radio. So I learned a little bit more about it there. But I didn't know any hams in the area. Uh, and nobody else I talked to seemed to know any hams in the area. So I, I really didn't have contact uh, directly like that. But... Uh, Anyway, uh, I was building these little projects, and uh, they would be like a little audio amplifier or a little, um, uh, some some real simple project. Anyway, there was a really good parts store in uh, the Pittsburgh area here at the time called Camera Radio, and uh, you could go there with a, a magazine article with a parts list, hand it to the guy at the counter there, and he would walk away, and he'd come back with a bag filled with all the parts in there. So they had absolutely everything that you could you could want from these uh, uh, publications. And at that time, I, I uh, saw they had on, uh, for sale, they had uh, amateur radio handbooks from the ARRL. 
So I, I picked up one of the uh, the handbooks and brought it home, and, and that's where I really started learning about amateur radio and the, and the theory behind everything, and it was really interesting. Um, and then uh, how did you I, find, I decided to... Jim, how did you okay. find your first ham? Uh, that's, that's really interesting because it wasn't until quite a while later when I was actually in the Army in Hawaii. I had... Uh, I had been stationed in Hawaii. I came back home uh, to get married, and then we went back with my wife to Hawaii to live there uh, while I was still in the Army. But anyway, before I came back to get married there, I had contacted the chaplain that was uh, assigned to my company in Hawaii there, and we were supposed to handle some paperwork and so forth uh, before I got married. Well, it turns out that he was a ham. And in his office, he had a, a, a Collins radio set up there, and he was listening to the Maritime Mobile Net. So anyway, we ended up talking for a while and mostly about amateur radio. <laughs> and it turns out, uh, since I had already studied everything for the, the ham novice uh, license, uh, he, he gave me the test, um, and I, I passed the novice test. So I was licensed when I came back home to get married and moved back to Hawaii. Well, that's pretty cool. Do you remember yeah. the, uh, who this was, what his uh, name and call I, sign was? I, you know, I was trying to think about it, and I don't remember. <laughs> but this is, this is back in 1970. So your first license so, then was, uh, you had this interest all these uh, over 15 years, and then you, you, your first yeah. license was in 1970. Yeah. So oh, actually, I was first licensed in 1971 in, um, I think, December or January of 1971. And uh, and I got married in in February of seventy one. So I uh, and we came back. So I said, well, now I've got an amateur radio license, and and I've got to do something about it here. So I got to get uh, some radio. Anyway, right before I went into the army at this same radio store I mentioned before, they had some used amateur equipment there. I had I had bought a, uh, a Heathkit HR ten receiver which was not a very good receiver, but it was cheap, and I, and I picked it up. And I, was, I had been listening on and off um, with just a wire hanging off the back of it uh, to amateur stations. And um, so anyway, I brought that back with me. And uh, relatives coming over to visit brought a DX6DB transmitter that I had also bought. So that was really my first uh, uh, station and uh, of course, I needed an antenna. Well, I lived in a, in a two-story apartment there, um, and I got permission from the landlord to put an antenna up on the roof in there in exchange for uh, inspecting his roof for him. I had worked construction when I was in school, uh, so I was familiar with being up on roofs and doing that sort of stuff. So we made a little bargain like that, and I ended up going to a local radio store there and bought a... Uh, 14 AVQ vertical antenna. Well, I had assembled it inside the apartment, and I, and I had a laying, you know, the length of the apartment, and it just barely fit <laughs> on the, the floor of the apartment. And uh, I said, well, here I've got an antenna, here I've got a radio, a receiver, and a transmitter. I really should do something with it. So I hooked it up to the antenna laying on the floor in, in the uh, apartment and uh, listened a little bit, and I hear... Uh, a uh, station calling CQ on the novice frequency there. And I only had like two or three crystals to go with the radio, and everything had to be crystal controlled at the time. And uh, so, you know, nervously and hesitantly, I went back to, I believe it was KL7JC or something like that in Alaska. So that was like 40, 42, 4,400 miles away. But this was on uh, 15 meters. And, uh, With a 14 AVQ lying on the floor. On the floor. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and he came back to me and gave me like a, uh, uh, I don't know, a 359 report or something, or 259 report. And uh, so I actually made my first contact that way on 15 meters. So after I got the antenna up onto the roof, you know, several days later, and got some ground radials on it and that sort of thing, uh, I really started making a lot of contacts there. 
And being in Hawaii, everybody in the world wanted to contact Hawaii. So I would actually have pileups on me as a novice in Hawaii, which was a little overwhelming at first, but I sort of got used to it. How long were you and, a novice uh, before you upgraded? <clears throat> I was actually a novice for, uh, well, it wasn't until I came back here to Pittsburgh. So it was probably a year and a half or so. And, and what did you think of the novice experience, you know, comparatively speaking? Well, I thought it was, I thought it was a really good experience. Um, there were, of course, there were restrictions, you know, because you had to be, at the time, you had to be crystal controlled and your, and your power was limited, but that wasn't really a problem. Um, but I think it forced you to learn proper operation, proper art operating procedures. Um, and the fact that I was there as a novice really uh, had me fine-tune operating procedures because of the, the fact that there was a lot of activity, a lot of interest in contacting the station. So I would be sending out QSL cards all around the world and getting them back. Um, it was interesting because in Hawaii, especially on 15 meters at the time, you could you could like work the entire world and it seemed to follow the 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 dark zone as the uh, you know goes from day to night or night to day, and you know and you'd have European stations coming in, and then you'd have a little break for a while, and then you'd hear the east coast of the U.S. coming in, and then all across the country, and then it would you'd hear the west coast, and then all of a sudden the South Pacific would start coming in, and Alaska, and then uh, it would shift over to Japan. And, and so forth. It was interesting the way you could pick a time of day and you knew what part of the world would be really uh, strong coming into Hawaii. So Hawaii was a really unique place to be a ham radio operator. Yeah, it certainly was. Uh, you know, I, I never actually met another ham there um, on the air, except that I had uh, I had make I'd made contact with one, especially um, every night, and it, it was let me see W. WH6HIQ, name was Terry. Uh, just about every evening after the band went dead, uh, we would get on there with CW. I could always recognize him because he had an HW16. It had a very unique chirp to it. <laughs> so I could tell his signal. So I could I could recognize it in a pileup. And, uh, and we would uh, go on for an hour or two every night on 15-meter uh, CW on 21111. I remember that. So it was interesting, and uh, I never actually met him in person, but I probably talked to him a thousand times on the, on the air on CW. And I, I did work him twice, I believe, since I came back here to Pittsburgh. When you returned to Pittsburgh and you upgraded, uh, what did you upgrade to, and were you still operating CW? Uh, I upgraded to I, – well, I had to go down to the FCC local office to take the test. I upgraded. I did the general class and the uh, advanced class at the same time. I'm still in advanced class. I decided not to to go for extra just to keep the advanced because it's again it's another rare thing. <laughs> uh, there are no longer uh, issued uh, advanced class licenses. So I uh, I did them both at the same time, and of course they uh, required the higher speed CW, which wasn't really a problem with me because of my experience with the novice class. But I, I continued to operate CW, and I still do, um, although not quite as much as I used to. Because you operate other modes, or you're too busy doing some other ham radio activity than operating? Actually, I spend most of my time building, <laughs> but... Uh -huh. uh, it, it's really because I just operate so many other modes, FM and uh, CW uh, and sideband as well. So you like the whole amateur radio package? Yeah, I, I used to run uh, teletype, and uh, and I, I had an old model 28 ASR that I adapted to AM radio use, and I ran slow scan for quite a few years, and uh, had some interesting tries at a lot of different modes. Now, when you returned to Pittsburgh, did a ham radio play a choice then in your education and career? Well, that's another interesting story there. I had graduated before I went in the Army from the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. And when I came back to uh, to Pittsburgh, I got a job with the United States Steel Corporation running a sign shop. So we produced signs for the entire U U.S. Steel Works and Mines. And I did that for about... Uh, Oh, about nine and a half, ten years. 
Now, when I was in the Army, I went to the Army Engineer School, so I got the technical background in that way. So after the U.S. steel industry pretty much shut down in Pittsburgh here and high tech was coming up, I applied for a job with uh, uh, an aerospace corporation and really based on my projects, pictures I'd shown of different projects I had designed and built uh, for amateur radio, I got a job as an engineering assistant and uh, so I did a career change there and went to... uh, went into electrical engineering at the time and learned quite a bit at that company and then uh, advanced from there on up. Oh, that's pretty amazing. So we were talking a little bit before I started recording that after reviewing your QRZ page that um, you really are an amazing builder and that you got to do this for a living. So this is what you did for a living. You, you would proto- You would design and prototype devices for this company? Well, I I did. Uh, see, I worked in all types of industries. I, I I worked from aerospace. In fact, I worked on a. I built. I designed and built a test system to test the uh, circuit boards that went on the Hubble telescope, for the control system, uh, at the aerospace company. But uh, I worked in heavy industry. I worked a lot of medical products, um, several medical um, equipment manufacturers and uh, heavy industry marking systems and so forth as well. So I, uh, I, I would, uh, for the most part, after I got a little bit more advanced in the in the design, uh, quite a few projects I designed them from scratch and uh, uh, prototyped them, and then usually it, it shifted off to a. a if it was going to be a full production item, it would shift off to another group that actually did uh, uh, the design from that point on to produce a final product. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And now this message from ICOM America. Heard it, worked it, logged it. It is time to get the ICOM transceiver that is best suited for your lifestyle. ICOM offers a variety of high-performance and innovative transceivers that fit your ham radio budget. See how you can make the most out of contest season with one of these fine transceivers. The IC7851 has the competitive edge that you've been looking for and the endorsement by Dr. Ulrich Rohde, N1UL, on episode 208 of the QSO Today podcast as being the best transceiver on the market today. Raise the bar and hear what others cannot with this flagship HF and 50 MHz transceiver. This is due to ICOM engineers focusing on the new local oscillator design that drastically reduces phase noise. This noise reduction in purity of the LO results in an RMDR of 110 dB, allowing you to hear the extremely weak signals, making the IC7851 the perfect rig for making contacts at the bottom of the sunspot cycle. In addition, this fine rig has a spectrum scope, dual receivers, and a digital voice recorder. The IC7610 is the SDR every ham wants and just in time for contest season. This high-performance SDR has the ability to pick out the faintest of signals in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. The new ICOM 7610 is a direct sampling software-defined radio that will change the world's definition of an SDR transceiver. Its features include RF direct sampling system, 110 dB RMDR, independent dual receivers, and dual digicell. The IC7300 has changed the way that an entry-level HF transceiver is designed. This rig is a high-performance, innovative HF transceiver with compact design that will far exceed your expectations. It includes an RF direct sampling system, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, internal antenna tuner, and an SD card memory slot. No matter which ICOM rig you choose, you'll be a winner. Be sure to check out these fine rigs at www.icomamerica.com. And when you finally go to make your ICOM purchase, be sure to tell the dealer that you heard it here on QSO Today. And now back to our QSO. I was searching the ARRL Periodicals Archive and Search and discovered that you began to contribute to QST now as far back as July 1983. Um, and you did that for a year or two in QST, but you also said earlier that you were also a contributor to Ham Radio Magazine. What kind of um, projects did you uh, write about in, in, uh, in those years, and what were your contributions there? Yeah, actually, my first uh, contributions were to uh, Ham Radio Magazine. I had uh, designed a – well, let me give you a little background here. 
about the time I did this, uh, the Atlas 210 mm. came on the market, you know, which was a very nice little radio. So it was so different from what else was out there because it, you know, especially its size and its uh, portability. So I said, I really need something about that same size. So I decided to build one. What else, you know? Because <laughs> mm-hmm. I couldn't afford to buy an Atlas 210. So I, uh, I uh, started with the receiver portion because I figured that's the best place to go. So I, I designed a receiver, and uh, to make it as simple as possible and to get it working right, I, I decided on two bands, 20 meters and 80 meters, because then I could use a 5 to 5.5 megahertz VFO and cover both bands. So I, uh, I built that up and prototyped it and modified it and, and fine-tuned the thing, and I got to the point where it seems to work extremely well. It had extremely low noise in it, really good sensitivity. Stability was good. You know, for the time, it was as good as what else what else was out there. But, uh, of course, it can't match new DDS control and that sort of thing. But uh, anyway, I, I built up the little receiver in a, uh, a bud chassis. And uh, a friend of mine... Uh, Bob Kirby, who was uh, a local ham here, said, you know, you really ought to send that into to uh, QST or ham radio or something and see if they'd be interested. So I did. I, I wrote up the article and I sent it in, and sure enough, they they picked it up for uh, uh, publication. And that was back in 19, uh, 1983, July issue. And it was called a modular two-band receiver. So meanwhile, I had been working on ex- expanding it into a transceiver, and uh, it, I, again, once I got that working okay, and it was for sideband and CW, uh, I uh, sent that in to Ham Radio, and they put in a follow-up article, which is called Extending the Modular Two-Band Receiver, and that uh, actually put it on uh, those two bands, the 20 meters and 80 meters, and that was published in November 1984. And that uh, design became the basis for some of my other projects in there. I actually, uh, on the QRZ page there, you can see a a transceiver. It's a white face and has an amplifier above it. That actually is that same design repackaged. Um, One thing unique about that receiver from ham radio, for the time anyway, was it had a digital display on it, which was uh, kind of a new thing at that time. And uh, it seemed to work really well. And that, so I actually made up a, about 36 sets of boards for it, and uh, those I etched myself and and uh, actually sold them to people to build with, uh, along with the kits of parts. So that was my first experience with uh, building a project that could be reproduced um, by other people. That was kind of interesting to do. Yeah, that, And then, um... of course, later on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The the that TF it, you call that particular transceiver what the TFS SB6? Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's beautiful. I, I when I first saw that I said, oh, oh, that that looks like a commercial transceiver, except I didn't recognize the front panel. So beautiful. Yeah. It's uh. This is early '80s, so you're using a seven segment LED display. Right. Yeah, and that was uh, kind of unique at the time there. Uh, most of the commercial radios had the analog display, so it was uh, it was an interesting project, and it worked well too. And it uh, and I called it uh, well. It it was I don't know I don't know why I called it that. It was multiple band anyway. Yeah. So it would cover 160 meters through uh, 10 meters. It was beautiful, and it, it's single side band, of course. So um, did you did you single offer- side band in? NCW. NCW, yes. Uh huh. Do you still have that radio? Oh yeah, I still use it. Oh, you do. Uh, it uh, it had to uh, have a couple of capacitor changes because of age. The uh, the VFO started drifting around in it. <laughs> uh, another thing I did with that, I, I did a lot of experiment experimenting with that. I also put an audio um, uh, compander into it, so it compressed on transmit and expanded on receive. And it really, really uh, gave a lot more punch to the to the signal. And um, I put a uh, sort of a digital VFO control system in it. If you look on the upper left hand side, there's two red buttons, and that actually sent the uh, the uh, 
a very loose PLL system in there to keep the uh, VFO locked on frequency, and it did well. I ran, actually ran that rig mobile for several years and um, made some really nice contacts with it. Now, you've got, uh, and there's some beautiful pictures on your QRZ site, and what I'll do is I'll put that as a link in the show notes page. Okay. The the construction method that you use is um, on printed circuit boards. Is that the your construction method of choice? Are you are you now um, still etching printed circuit boards, or do you proto board something first before you um, take it to the printed circuit board? At this point, I usually uh, prototype it on perf board. Um, I I got out of making my own circuit boards for the most part. I just I use a commercial project or product to. Uh, produce the files for a uh, circuit board and then send them into another company to have them manufactured. They can do a much better job than I can at home. And I, it opens up access to multi-layer boards and uh, feed through uh, plating and all that sort of stuff that you can't do at home. But um, on the page there, you can see, I believe, let me look on my page here. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a picture of uh, one of the newer projects that I had uh, that was published in QST uh, a transceiver and that's all on prototype boards and that was the design that uh, that was the basis of the uh, article from uh, January 2016 that wasn't either that wasn't 2016 that was what was that 2017 I believe you see I have it I actually have it open here on my desk yeah, the the prototype was on the. Uh, so it was August two thousand and seventeen, I think. Right? August twenty seventeen. Yes, that's right. correct. And that was part of that project was the receiver that was published back in uh, twenty fifteen or twenty sixteen. The all mode receiver. That all mode receiver is the is the one that uses an SDR dongle, and it um and you have right. a two band switch, so you actually go from. What almost like five kilohertz to one point five gigahertz with that receiver? Yeah, one kilohertz to about uh, one point seven gigahertz. Yeah, it'll cover anywhere in there and just about any mode. Uh, your your modes are really uh, determined by the software you use to control it. What's interesting about this project to me is is um, you know, this whole thing started off with a a, a very simple SDR receiver, and I guess you must have had people say, oh, you should have a transmitter to go with that. And then when you see the picture exactly. of the transmitter, I mean that the, all of a sudden this thing becomes a uh, like an eight band, one sixty through ten meter uh, single sideband transceiver, which is really cool. Exactly. Yeah, and just you build it up as as modules. That's the easiest way to design. Actually, is you just you start with the simplest part of the module or the the overall design. In this case, uh, like if, if you were doing a receiver. Uh, just a standard uh, analog type receiver. The easiest part to start with is the audio amplifier on the output. Um, do that, get that operational, um, get it very stable, get the gain that you want out of it. That use that as a module, so you're done with that part. Uh, the same, then go to the the VFO possibly. Build up your VFO, make sure it's stable and works correctly. There's another module. And when you start doing more designs based on that, you can just grab this module. You know, you've already designed it and and uh, tested it, and you know that it works correctly. Use that circuit again. Why redesign it again? So you just grab these blocks and you just put them all together, and all of a sudden you've got a complete system there that works. So it can be reproduced. So you'll etch um, individual circuit boards as modules. So you you may have the the audio amplifier module, or you might have the um, uh, RF front end pre selector module, or something like that already in stock. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's the easiest way to do it, uh, and it saves a lot of time in the long run. Now for that transceiver, I broke that up into actually three different boards, which was the main part of the receiver. So you had a board that actually. Uh, took the microphone input and generated um, single sideband output and dumped the output into a mixer. Then you had a uh, another board, which was the amplifier filter board, and that, would, that covered the, uh, the bands that you wanted, and it amplified the signal coming out of that first board there. And then, of course, to control the whole thing, you needed uh, digital control. So I built a DDS design, which actually used two commercial 
very inexpensive DDS modules, controlled them with a, uh, uh, a, micro, a Texas Instrument microprocessor, uh, 430G2553, 430 I believe I used on there, and uh, that's connected through a USB to your computer. So you can set your frequency that you want to operate on from the DDS module, and that controls everything on your sideband transmitter. One DDS module controls your, your BFO injection frequency uh, for the uh, upper or lower sideband for the, uh, the transmit, and then the other one controls the, uh, is, it goes into the mixer that mixes with the other DDS controlled module and generates your output frequency. And then, of course, that is filtered and then amplified, and there's your your output on the frequency that you want to operate on. And the rest of the circuitry in there is just either filtering or control, like with relays, switching, and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Do you do your own um, metal fabrication? Uh, on some things I do. Uh, if there's a, a commercial box available for the right price, you know, I'll use that. But... Um, Especially on the earlier stuff, I would uh, I would do my own metalwork, and really consisted of nothing more than uh, a drill, a nibbling tool, and, uh, and a file, and some uh, <laughs> and a file to straighten things out. And then for the panels, I would just paint the panel, use uh, transfer lettering, just rub on lettering, and then uh, use an acrylic spray over top of it to to seal it. Are you still doing transfer lettering? Uh, I do still use transfer lettering, although it's getting hard to find now. For some reason, they're not manufacturing it anymore. Uh, they have all the uh, very fancy fonts and uh, you know things for like scrapboarding and stuff like that. But that was pretty much a standard in the electronics industry back in the uh, 70s and 80s. Yeah, no, I remember the transfer lettering. I, I also think I'm, there must be there are companies now that um, you essentially use your CAD program and you can send them. Uh, send them the artwork, and they'll actually, you know, uh, print the board, uh, print the cu the front panel, and drill all the holes and stuff for you as well. Although that, that's not a, a poor man's way to to make a front panel. Right, that, that's good if you're going to do several of something, you know. But uh, if you're just doing one of a kind, you can make nice looking panels yourself. You can also use your uh, uh, computer, and on, if you have access to the laser printer, you can lay out your panel uh, on. Uh, on the uh, the computer, and then uh, print it onto clear uh, film, and then put that over your your panel, and it'll it'll look real nice, and it'll protect your panel, and you'll have your lettering all lined up. Still have to punch your holes in there, but uh, drilling holes is not a big problem. Uh, do you have a drill press, or do you use a hand drill? I I do have a drill press, and I try and use that if I can. It's a uh, it's a more stable way of doing things, uh -huh. especially if you want to get several in line, you know. If you're drilling a hole for a switch or something, it doesn't really matter a whole lot. What inspires your projects these days? Well, what I've been trying to do lately is, you know, I've become aware over the last several years that the level of technical expertise in the amateur community, I think, has really been diminishing ever since I started uh making the test more a memorization process than a knowledge process. I mean, it used to be you had to go in there and draw a, uh, an oscillator or an amplifier circuit to pass the test. And now you just have to uh, remember the answer to the pre-published uh, question and, uh, and you'll pass the test. And there didn't seem to be a lot of desire to go beyond that for a lot of people. And I kept hearing on the on the radio talking to different people that, well, you can't build anything anymore. You can't get parts and you can't do this, you know, and that sort of thing. Things are too complicated, but they're not. Yeah, if you, if you do it properly, they're not that complicated. Um, now, it is true that it's difficult, and, and I've spent many, many hours um, trying to find a substitute part for a a better part that used to be available, um, you know, but it's no longer available in um, through hole, but it is available in surface mount. But I try to avoid surface mount strictly for the, the fact that it's difficult to work with. Uh, 
especially as you get older, it's just it's just too hard to handle these parts with uh, a tiny spacing between the, the the pins. And and let's face it, you can sneeze once and lose uh, 50 resistors and capacitors with <laughs> when you're dealing with surface mount. Uh, it, so it is. Uh, it's a little more difficult to design now, but it's certainly no more difficult to uh, to build something yourself. In fact, uh, the availability of parts is just so wide, and it's and the fact that there's a lot of pre-assembled modules out there for very low cost uh, makes it uh, even easier to do some very complex things. In fact, there's another article that will be coming out soon in QST that I wrote that uh, uses uh, several off-the-shelf, low-cost modules, and uh, by using them in uh, just a little bit of through-hole circuitry, uh, you can produce a, uh, a 50 megahertz, you know, six-meter um, SDR transceiver for FM, and uh, that's the basis of that article. Oh, that, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, where do you find these uh, these modules on eBay or AliExpress, places like that? Yeah, they've got them on eBay. They've got them, you know, on on several different sites. Um, the DDS modules they're based on the uh, analog devices ninety eight fifty or ninety eight fifty one uh, modules, and they sell anywhere from. I mean, I bought them as cheap as seven dollars a piece, and I think I've seen them on there for forty nine dollars. And why anyone would pay forty nine dollars for a seven dollar part, I don't know. <laughs> but they are available, widely available, and uh, along with the uh, one of those I use uh, a uh, Arduino Nano to control it, which is available for like three dollars. And uh, I use a couple of cable TV amplifiers off the shelf that go for like five or six dollars, and uh, use that to amplify it. So you know the DDS module generates the output on six meters directly. I uh, take an analog input uh, circuitry digitize it and add that to the control um, the control numbers to program the DDS module. So generate FM directly and then just run the output through some filtering and some amplification and there's your six meter uh, FM signal. So you oh, that's amazing. Your transmitter and uh, talk through the repeaters. I'm buying parts quite a lot and you know for those the listeners know that I'm I'm here in Israel and it's not that Israel's out in the middle of nowhere, although we are quite a ways from North America. But I buy parts on DigiKey, and if you buy a hundred dollars yeah. worth of parts, you get free shipping worldwide. So uh, I find parts are really easy to get. And when I'm ordering parts, I just let my friends know that I'm ordering parts, and we kind of all go together. I can get what I need, and uh, everyone else gets it. And uh, believe it or not, I think in America probably you can get your DigiKey order in a few days and. And even here in Israel, I think I have my DigiKey order in a week. So I think it's easier now than it's ever been to get parts. I think you're right. Uh, so I used I use DigiKey or Mauser uh, quite a bit. And, uh, yeah, it takes about two days to get uh, delivery. It's amazing. In fact, yeah. on the articles I wrote there, I, I specified all the parts based on DigiKey parts. Well, you know, what's what's also interesting is uh, are these modules that you're buying from AliExpress or eBay I can't believe what you're getting for the price. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, I, I bought a bunch of um, uh, temperature controllers with a digital displays for $3.50 a piece. Yeah. I mean, it, it's um, it's amazing. Yeah, I, I think it probably has to do with the labor costs. <laughs> uh, it could be, yeah. Yeah. And uh, they're, also, uh, they're also SMD. I, I also, um, I also uh, have the same sense that you do about SMD parts. I've got one right now that's, two millimeters on a side, well, I can't even see the thing. And so I'm trying to figure out, uh, maybe I take my own, my iPhone 4 and use the camera just to be able to see if I can <laughs> figure out what side is up with the uh, with the part. So uh, I, I hear you there on the, on the SMD parts. Yeah, I mean, you've got resistors and capacitors that are like dust. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. You, you make sure you don't have a cold before you uh, go near your workbench because, as you said earlier, it doesn't take a lot to blow those things off the bench, and finding them on the floor yeah. is almost impossible, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, when I was working on commercial projects, I, I did several of those in surface mount because of the need to, number one, um, do extremely high production and low cost and, and very small size, especially like some portable uh, medical uh, products. 
Um, but those are all assembled by robot. You know, the people don't touch those parts at all. It just goes into the machine, and the, and the machine uses the files, and it, it dumps out a finished board at the end of the, of the production line. And, uh, you know, so people don't realize that, but even uh, even to rework something like that without the proper equipment is just uh, very difficult. Not impossible, but difficult. We just need a new set of eyes, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And yeah, I, I mean, I use a nice uh, six-inch uh, diameter uh, magnifying glass with a, a nice light around it. That really helps me, even with the through-hole parts. Well, you know, I have one of those, and I still can't see it. I didn't realize how small it would be. And if you make a mistake, uh, the footprint I had was um, a three-millimeter on a side footprint, and that makes it completely usable with a two-millimeter part. And when you think of two millimeters, two millimeters is what? Not very much. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> you can't even see the you can't even see the legs on the thing with with your naked eye. Yeah, I, I use real dimensions over here. I use inches and yes, that's what I use here. <laughs> well, so what are we talking about then? We're talking about uh, two millimeters is is what a tenth of an inch. <laughs> I like I like a tenth of an inch. That's uh, <laughs> that's a good dimension on a side. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now that's for that's for lead spacing. That's why I like through hole parts. And now this message from QRP Labs. Hans Summers, G Zero UPL, informs me that he has sold over five thousand QCX transceiver kits. I hope that in large part this is due to the promotion on the QSO Today podcast of this amazing single board transceiver kit for under fifty dollars from QRP Labs. The QCX is a feature-packed, high-performance, single-band, 5-watt CW transceiver kit with whisper beacon and built-in alignment and test equipment tools. It is available for 80, 60, 40, 30, 20, or the 17-meter bands. It has a rotary encoder synthesized tuning, VFO, AB split, iambic keyer, CW decoder, and more. You can assemble this kit yourself with standard tools and a soldering iron. There are no surface mount components to solder as the two SMD ICs are already factory pre-soldered on the board. Of course, Hans has a whole range of accessories to trick out this ride, using the language of hot rod cars. Since Hans has shipped over 5,000 QCXs, there is a rapidly growing community of builders and users who are fine-tuning the QCX in an open-source kind of way and sharing it with us on the Internet. So if you're ready to build your own rig, or want to save money, or just want that prepper rig for your bomb shelter, use the link on this week's show notes page to get to QRP Labs. Please use my link as it tells Hans that you heard about it here on QSO Today. QRP Labs is my favorite kit company. It should be yours, too. QRP Labs. And now, back to our QSO today. So do you uh, make your projects, or do you start your projects on paper first, or are you a guy now that just goes right to schematic capture? No, I, I usually uh, do it on paper first. I'll, I'll do an outline. and quite. I mean, the, the thing has, um, block diagramming has sort of gone out of... Uh, normal usage nowadays, but even for my software, I like to do block diagramming. Um, so I'll say, okay, I need an audio amplifier, I need uh, a VFO, I need an oscillator, I need a mixer, and I'll just do a block like that. And then uh, those circuits that I've developed over the years that work extremely well in those applications, if they're applicable to the project I'm working on, I'll just grab that part of the schematic and stick it in there because, you know, why redesign it if it works so well? And the parts are available and that sort of thing. Uh, quite often lately, though, as I do that, I, I look and start looking at part numbers, and I find that that part that I always like to use is no longer available in through hole. So I got to find a substitute, and that brings on, of course, prototype. Put it together as a prototype module, test it, you know, abuse it a bit, try and make sure that it um, is completely stable and it. Uh, doesn't burn up with constant use and that sort of thing, and, and so that becomes the replacement for that that part there or that module. Uh, but I I do that on uh, I, I do it th that way, and then I'll go ahead and draw up a schematic uh, once I get beyond that point, and then I'll uh, on most projects I'll just go ahead and prototype them, and I'll use perf board, 
because you can buy really high quality perf board like on eBay for next to nothing. And uh, you can see on uh, on, Q, on QRZ there that uh, I've even used some perf board in the uh, final transceiver there uh, just to hold the relay modules and that sort of stuff uh, because it's um, it's much less expensive, of course, than generating a PC board. And it, you know, you can just put your parts on there and do point-to-point -point wiring on it. That works fine. You got to be careful with uh, perf board when you're doing RF circuits. You have to keep your leads very short, and you have to. Uh, I use uh, uh, copper tape to simulate a ground plane and uh, to isolate some signals from other and that sort of thing. Uh, but you can you can do most things, especially at the lower frequencies on perf board, without any real problem. And it just makes it so much easier to develop the product that way because you can. Uh, you can pull parts out easily and replace them with different things to make changes and jump from this part to that part and so forth. And then if it's a part, if it's a design that's going to be for reproduction, like for a magazine article or something like that, then I'll take the prototype finished uh, module uh, on perf board and then uh, design a circuit board that uh, does the same thing. And um, then that is then I would send to a, a commercial company that generates PC boards to uh, make those boards. Do you have a favorite schematic capture and board layout software? I use uh, CAD Soft Eagle. I've used that for many years. I use it commercially. I have a, a commercial uh, package of that. That's uh, soup to nuts. That's uh, schematic capture and the uh, board layout, and it generates the Gerber files that are are used by the PC board manufacturer. Actually, it, yes, it does everything. It even does auto routing and that sort of thing. Although auto routing doesn't work really well with the high frequency stuff. Do you um, do any simulation? Do you use something like LT Spice to simulate in software your your designs? Um, some some des parts of the design I'll check with um, Electronic Workbench. That's an older program, uh, and I think it's been bought up by somebody else now. But I've got an old copy, and it's good enough for what I need to do. And it's called Electronic Workbench. Well, that's pretty it, cool. Uh, you can you can you can put in all the parts and simulate them, and you can you know add instrumentation, look at uh, look at the uh, signals, and look at the oscilloscope and function generator and, and that. You can load spice files if you want into it. But it um, you, you got to use it with hesitation because it's not real world, but it's close. You know, it gives you a, a ballpark to work with. But when you're, you're dealing with RF circuits, uh, prototyping, typically you end up changing some parts values because it doesn't take into account uh, the PC board layout, the... Uh, um, proximity to a metal chassis, that sort of thing, which all can affect the overall design. What's the most interesting piece of test gear that you have on your workbench? Uh, well, unfortunately, since I'm retired, I don't have access to some of the real fancy stuff there. But I, I have a couple of oscilloscopes and uh, uh, a home-built uh, spectrum analyzer and uh, function generators and adjustable power supplies and all that sort of stuff. One of the most interesting things for RF is just a uh, home-built, uh, very low-power uh, watt meter, which allows me to uh, put in a, a signal of, let's say, minus 30 dBm and uh, and actually measure it, which is very good for working with oscillators and buffer stages and, and things like that. Oh, that's pretty cool. And is that something that's, uh, that's using... Uh, new digital components, or is it something that based on an old design? No, it's it's analog. It uh, it's actually um, very similar to one that was published in uh, uh, I think it was in QST not too many years ago. Uh, I'd look on it here and see if I have it listed, but I, I don't have the article right now. But it was you can f search on um, the ARR, ARRL archives, and it. Uh, it shows a uh, an RF sampler design, and this is part of that article as well. Now, you you say that your other hobby is is that you uh, restore old cars. You've got a picture of a 1940 Ford Deluxe Coupe. So this is a, a yeah. this is a Ford, I think, right? 
Yeah, Ford Deluxe That's Coupe. Correct. It's um, it was I think my father's first car, so he um he also restored uh, these old Fords in the garage. So do you have a complete auto shop in your uh, garage too? Uh, not really. I I have what I need. <laughs> I don't really have much room though. I only have a single car garage, which makes it a little bit difficult. But that car actually I acquired that in 1968. And I built it up as a race car. I did drag racing with it for a couple of years before I went in the Army. And uh, had about a 520-horsepower engine in it. And I uh, ran a, you know, 11 seconds flat at 136 mile an hour and a quarter mile. And it, it, so it was a, a pretty quick car there. And then when I went in the Army, I put it up on blocks. And it actually sat till about 1993 when I... Uh, pulled it out of there, uh, stripped it down, put in a full interior in it, put a milder engine into it, and turned it into a street rod. So it's uh, it's now a uh, just a driver, occasional driver. Now, is there a rumble seat in the back? No, that one doesn't have a rumble seat. They stopped them in uh, 38, I believe. Yeah, it's a beautiful car. Would you Would you consider, like, putting a hole in it for an antenna? Oh, no, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought, car, I, I wanted to see how committed that. you were <laughs> to ham radio. No, I, I bolted it on the bumper bracket. But that's about it. Uh huh. Now, you um, you said that you're operating the other modes. Uh, what other modes are, are you operating or are you active? I, I operate on sideband, uh, mostly on 40 meters lately because the bands have been a little strange, although I do go on 20 and 10 occasionally. And uh, CW, uh, usually on 40 as well. I don't have an antenna for 160 or 80 at the moment here. Um, and recently I've been working on 6-meter FM because I, well, I was building that project and there's a, a local 6-meter, a couple of local 6-meter repeaters here I've been using. Uh, I don't uh, operate teletype or or slow scan TV anymore. You know, I haven't spoken to anybody for years and years that uh, has operated six meter FM. How does it feel? I mean, does it feel like two meters or UHF? I mean, it does it propagate differently? It it uh, it acts like ten meters quite a bit. Um, yet it feels like like uh, well, especially with the repeaters, it feels like uh, uh, two meters. Mm-hmm. It. Um, it's a good band. I noticed on the uh, spectrum display, while listening to repeaters, there's a lot of digital activity on the bottom end of six meters. I'm seeing a lot of uh, Pactor and and other things back down there. So when you get an opening, it, it seems to be wide open, uh, similar to ten meters. But, but you're uh, you're the, vertically polarized, polarized though on six meter FM, right? So uh, yes. Yes, I, I've got a, a J pole out there. Um, my guess is it, it wouldn't necessarily be propagating the same way uh, vertically polarized as it does horizontally polarized, is, or is that different? Do you actually can you end up working repeaters in other states as a result of the propagation? When propagation is is uh, there, it you can reach out long distances on six meters, but uh, I. You know, I, I don't have a lot of experience with it as far as the long term, you know, what it's like. But um, I think, but as far as uh, as polarization on the antenna goes, I think it operates very much the same as uh, as 10 meters, you know, vertical, a lot of ground plane, low angle of radiation. Um, horizontal, I think you'd probably reach out quite a bit distance further. What kind of impact has amateur radio had on your family life? Well, that's interesting. When I, when I first got married, uh, my wife asked asked my mother and said, uh, "This ham radio thing, how think how long do you think that's going to last?" And she said, "Oh, it'll probably lose interest in about a year." So that was 1970. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's going to last a year. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's some interesting uh, happenings with ham radio over the years. So, uh, did your wife ever get her license? No, she didn't really show any interest in it. Any children? And did they also get their licenses? I have I have three kids, and my son is interested. He's uh, he's studying now for it, and I think he'll end up getting it eventually. Um, but uh, the girls, nah, they're not interested at all. 
Oh, that's pretty interesting. What excites you the most about what's happening in amateur radio now? Well, I look at it more as the technical end of things. Um, it seems that there's been some major advances in the in the uh, receivers and transmitters. Uh, I think especially with STR, uh, flex radio has really uh, pushed that spectrum quite a bit. Uh, I think you're seeing some major advances there. And uh, you see ICOM now with the 7300, which was really a lower a lower cost uh, SDR design. Uh, seems to be picking up on it. You can actually make a uh, an extremely good SDR for a lot less money and much less trouble in uh, alignment and so forth than you can with a, an analog design. And I think that uh, the fact that you can do your filtering and your demodulation all digitally uh, really makes it makes the receivers especially so much better than they were before. I mean, I can, I can with with my SDRs here that I've built, I can look at a signal that's maybe three to four decibels above the, the noise floor, and within proper filtering and uh, noise reduction in the software, I can bring that signal to the level that it's perfectly copyable. And you can't do that with an analog machine. It's just... Uh, just not capable. All you can do is clip off the noise at the level of the signal, and that's as good as you can get. Now, with your uh, SDR transceiver, or at least the uh, the transceiver that kind of grew out of the your SDR radio uh, receiver design, how important is front end filtering? Then, are you doing front end filtering in the amateur bands for that? Yeah, filtering is extremely important with SDRs. Uh, people try and use a dongle for HF, and it just gets overloaded with the FM broadcast or AM broadcast or other signals. Uh, filtering is the critical element with with an SDR. And um, I don't know if you can see on the board there on the uh, QRZ page there, but uh, there's a multi-stage uh, low-pass filter on the input and the cutoff frequency for that is, uh, I believe it was 32 megahertz. So that's active whenever you use the, use the uh, receiver on the HF bands. And that gives you very good attenuation uh, up at the, at the FM broadcast bands. Now, I do have one AM broadcast signal that's uh, within a bile of me, and they run 50,000 watts. And uh, that does tend to overload uh, occasionally. So I build a uh, broadcast band a rejection filter that I use external to that on that receiver whenever I'm using it. You know, the low-pass filter, and then you uh, have the additional bandpass filters, right? On on the uh, transceiver, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Really cool. Now, did you wind all those yourself, all those toroids? Yeah, because... Uh, mm -hmm. That's another interesting thing with toroids. Um, it seems their quality has changed a bit over the years. It used to be that you could calculate the number of turns uh, required, put it on the core, and you were pretty close to what your value uh, was expected to be. Lately, uh, although I'm using the same brand cores and the same mixes and that sort of thing, I find that I need a lot fewer turns than... Um, and then they're calculated. Um, so you really, ideally, you need to uh, to measure those inductors after you wind them, if they become, you know, if they're in a critical portion of it. Now, for instance, on the front end filter for the receiver, if that filter has a cutoff at 31 megahertz or 32 megahertz, it really doesn't matter a whole lot. But if it was used in a uh, a, uh, a an oscillator stage of some port that would be very critical, you know, if, if it was the right value. And what do you use to um, to sweep those filters so you can actually see how they're performing? Uh, I use uh, I've got a couple of things here that I use. One of which is an old uh, RF analyst uh, module, which is no longer manufactured. It's an antenna analyzer, but I also have an MFJ. Uh, uh, MFJ266 antenna analyzer, and that can be used to measure inductance as well. 
So there you go. For people that want to multi-purpose their uh, antenna analyzer, they can use it as a piece of uh, bench test equipment for building. Yeah. Now, if you've got an old uh, grid depth meter, of course, you can use that as well. You just put a uh, a known value capacitor across it and uh, measure the resonant frequency, and you can calculate the uh, the actual value you have. Well, that's, that's pretty another cool. Another item that uh, that has sort of gone out of use here, but I've got a Millen uh, a grid dip oscillator I use quite a bit. Well, pretty amazing. What advice then, Jim, would you give to newer returning hams to the hobby? I would say try and learn more all the time. It's uh, there's so much more that you don't know. I mean, I learn stuff every day. It's uh, it's amazing what uh, is out there. Just don't limit yourself to the commercial equipment. It's fine to buy commercial equipment and use it, uh, but do you really need to buy a commercial dipole? You know, you can you can buy a spool of wire and make your own for hardly any money, and you might learn something in the process. Um, build something simple. You know, even if it's uh, a cable. <laughs> you know, just do something. Get into it a little bit more, and you'll understand a little bit more about it. But try and find out not only what to do to make a commercial piece of equipment work, but try and figure out how it works. And you can't beat something like the ARRO handbook to explain every part of that uh, device that you have there. But read it over, learn about it, ask, uh, ask the older hams that have experienced it, and you'd be surprised what you can learn about that. Right, and you don't have to buy the new ARRL handbook if you find one, an old one at uh, a swap meet or something like that or a ham fest. Um, it's still a, a, an amazing source of information, right? Yeah, exactly. And the old ham radio magazines, that that's a magazine I really miss because it was so technically oriented. Um, if you can pick one of those up at the ham fest, you know, look at it. You'll be amazed at what you see in there and what you can learn. Um, if you get into the older QSTs, you'll get into a lot of tube equipment. If you're not really interested in tubes, uh, they might be a little bit outdated for you, but theory doesn't change. You know, it's uh, a coil, an inductor, and a capacitor work the same as they've worked in 1920. <laughs> yeah, they're not a whole lot different. You just understand how they work. And uh, another thing I found, too, is there's uh, some very good videos on YouTube uh, explaining some of the intricacies of, uh, of electronic design. Um, quite a few by amateurs and quite a few by um, professional um, instructors. And uh, you can learn quite a bit on that, too. Just tune in, listen, You'd be amazed what you can pick up. Yeah, Jim, we live in amazing times, don't we? Certainly do. Jim, you've been such a wonderful guest. I really appreciate your joining me on the QSO Today podcast. With that, I want to wish you uh, 73, and thank you for coming on. Well, thank you, Eric. I enjoyed talking with you. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Jim. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in WA3TFS in the search box at the top of the page. My thanks to both ICOM America and QRP Labs for their support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of these fine sponsors by clicking on their links in the show notes pages or when you make your purchases that you say that you heard it here on QSO Today. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any of the other episodes into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes page. I am grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference. QSO Today is now available on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Libsyn, and TuneIn, as well as the iTunes Store. If you own an Amazon Echo, you can say, Alexa, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. I still use Stitcher to listen to podcasts on my smartphone. The links to all of these services are on the show notes pages on the right side. Until next time, this is Eric for Z1UG 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.